Turn your Bibles, please, to Colossians 1, uh, where we'll be today. And just want to let you know that my sermon um, is tailored to the fact that we have children in the service, so I preach about just about half an hour, and uh, not any longer, really. Knowing that the kids are here, and also wanting to let you know that I'm really glad the children are able to join us, which is a wonderful thing. And if they coo or cry, it doesn't bother me at all, because it's good to have um, little lives in the church. And um, if you want to, there's also space out in the lobby or at the back of the church that you can walk the kids back and forth, um, as some have done or some do. But uh, always good to have the children here. And we're working on getting the children's ministry going, but um, the construction was delayed some because of the lockdown, as you know. And also, I'm not sure exactly precisely what the uh, government regulations are on that either. So we're trying to sort all this stuff out at the moment. Um, But we're in Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 at this point. And the last we talked, the last I preached, I preached on Christ's relationship to the creation and spoke on his preeminency over creation. So he is sovereign and preeminent over creation. Today, I speak on his sovereignty and preeminency over the new creation. Redemption, the new creation. The world was created. The world rebelled against God in sin and decayed and and was corrupted. And the world is being recreated by Jesus Christ. That's the redemption. And so today, even as last week, I spoke about Christ's sovereignty and preeminency over creation. Today, we learn about Christ's sovereignty and preeminency over the new creation. Let me read from Colossians 1, 18 through 20. And he is head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Bow with me for a quick word of prayer. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the reading of your word. We thank you for your word. It is a good gift to us. We thank you for our Christ who stands preeminent over creation and preeminent over the new creation, which begins in the church and has begun with him and begins in the church. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon this time together, that you would anoint the preaching and the hearing, that the proper application of your word would be made and would be received. We pray it would be properly preached and properly understood. Build up your church in unity and strength and power. Save sinners. We pray for the little children in the church, especially today. Thank you that they're able to join us, and we pray that the little children would leave believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ knowing that they are counted in Christ as saved, saved by his blood. Please, Father, anoint this time and bless it in Christ's name. Amen. So as I mentioned, last week we talked about Christ's relationship to the creation. This week we speak of, I speak of Christ's relationship to the new creation, the redemption. So there was creation, Then there was corruption, and now there is a new creation that is happening before us in Jesus Christ. That's the story of the world. And all of human history, all of world history is finally going to be complete when the new creation is finally complete, when we live in incorruptible flesh, in incorruptible relationships on an incorruptible earth. And that is how it's all going to end. And so I have five points today, five truths about Jesus Christ as he relates to the redemption, the new creation. Five truths about Jesus Christ as he relates to the redemption, the new creation. And the first truth is this. First truth is, he is the head of the church. He is the head of the church. You see it right there in verse 18. And it's the first point. He is the head of the body, the church. Now, when we talk about Christ's headship over the church, there's a few things that come to mind. One would be that he is the source of life. From him flows life. He gives us life as a church. He prunes the church. 
And he causes the church to live and to grow. Gives us life, disciplines us, and he causes us to live and grow. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 through 16 speaks the same way. It says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, makes the body grow. He holds the body together. He gives the body life. And the body is the church. He's the source of life. Second aspect of this, or at least on top of that, him being the head of the church, not only does he give the body life, but he rules over the church. He rules supreme over the church. So when we talk about headship, we're not talking just about being a source of life. We're talking about sovereignty, rulership over the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ being the head of the church means he has the final say in the church and it is his word that stands over the church. He is the norm of norms. His law is the law of laws. Every norm must bow to him. Every law must bow to him. His word has dispensation to govern the church. He is the church's head. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 through 23, read something similar. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him, fills us all in all. Jesus, being the head of the church, means the church must submit to him. Church takes its orders from Christ. His word and his word alone has supremacy over the church. And the church self-governs under his supremacy. It is under his rulership that the church is to be governed. So, for example, John Calvin, commenting on this passage, notes, he shows, speaking of Paul and Colossians, that it is Christ, Christ alone, that has authority to govern the church. That it is he to whom alone believers ought to have an eye, and on whom alone the unity of the body depends. Christ and Christ alone has sovereignty, rulership, and his word alone is the governing document over the body of Christ. William Hendrickson comments similarly. He notes, Now, if the Son of God is the organic and ruling head of the church, then the church is in no sense whatever dependent on any creature, angel, or otherwise. Does not the church receive both its growth and guidance from its living Lord? Is it not energized by His power and governed by His Word and Spirit? Hence, is it not true that in Christ it has all it needs, and also that without him it cannot accomplish nothing. So, so Christ being the head of the church, having preeminency in the church, he has purchased the church with his own blood, gives the church life, and he himself has sovereignty to rule the church, and every word, law, or rule must bow to his rule in the church. Any person or institution that asserts supremacy over the church outside of the rule of the Word of God does so unlawfully, essentially taking the bride of Christ to the gallows. This is how the church ought to recognize her Christ. He is her head. He governs her. We are not to be governed by our own devices. We are not to trust in our own ways. We are to love our Lord and see Him is the head of the church, and submit to him above all others. That's the first truth I want to bring to your attention today. That Jesus Christ, Christ is head of his church. That means that he gives his church life, he gives his church growth and sanctification and holiness, and 
He has exclusive rights to reign supreme by his word over the life of his church. Jesus Christ is head of the church. There is no other head of the true church of Jesus Christ. And to deny as much is to attempt to decapitate the head. Jesus Christ, head of the church. Second point I want to bring to your attention today. Not only is Christ head of the church, but he is the beginning. He is the beginning. Verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. The head of the body, the church, and the beginning. Now, we talked about the beginning I'm, uh, rather, I'll, I'll mention that a little later. This refers to his priority of place. The church has existed by the first initiative of Jesus Christ. He bought the church with his blood. Why does the church exist? Why have we existed for 2,000 years? Why? Because it's by his initiative. Nobody else's first initiative. His. Why has the church been sustained all these years? By his initiative. He bought the church by his own blood. He commissioned the church with the Great Commission, sent us out into the world to make disciples. He anointed the church with the Holy Spirit of God, pouring his spirit on the church, anointing us and giving us power to preach the gospel and win people for Jesus Christ so that they may sing his praise to his glory. He has commissioned the church, and he is the cornerstone of the church. And his entire enterprise of the church was instituted and begun by him. You see, the church is all by his initiative. He purchased her, he commissioned her, he anointed her by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the cornerstone of the church, upon which the entire church holds together, and the entire enterprise of the church has been established and initiated by Jesus Christ. This is wonderful, because things that are established and initiated by Jesus Christ cannot fail. And I think in our day where little attention is paid to history, we have 2,000 years of church history to reflect on, knowing that the story of the church began with Christ, Him sending His people out into all nations so that they may make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all beginning with Him. And how has He sustained the church for these 2,000 years? By His initiative. If it was by our initiative, by our ability, by our power, the church would have been snuffed out a long time ago. But by his initiative, the church has been sustained and the church has flourished over 2,000 years. There's been hard times and there's been good times over those 2,000 years. But it has always been carried by Christ because he will see his plans to completion. This is the story of the church. Jesus Christ, number one, head of the church, Jesus Christ, the beginning of the church. Number three, here's my third point. Jesus Christ, the firstborn. The firstborn. Last week we learned, as we looked at the text last week, that being the firstborn in an ancient culture indicated that the firstborn would be the heir of the father's estate. So a firstborn son could anticipate that he would receive the entirety of his father's estate. And when Jesus Christ is called the firstborn of creation, it means that everything is his in creation. Well, in our text today, we are told that he is the firstborn from the dead. Last week, remember, we're talking about creation. This week, we're talking about new creation. He is the firstborn from the dead. Now, in this case, when we're speaking of being the firstborn of the dead or from the dead, we're speaking of redemption. Paul, who wrote Colossians, also picked up on this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. The Apostle Paul noted, 
But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So, a lot of farmers right now have been cutting hay, I've noticed, and baling their hay. It's dry. This is their first cut of the season, I think, for a lot of you. But it's not the last. There'll likely be some more hay that's cut. When Jesus Christ is called the first fruits of the new creation or the firstborn of the new creation, that means there's more to come. So what happened is, is we have corruptible bodies. The idea of redemption is the idea that we will one day have incorruptible bodies. We live in a corruptible world that is always in decay. The idea of redemption is that one day we will live in an incorruptible world. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead in an incorruptible body. He is the first incorruptible one. And we will follow suit. That's what it means that he is the first born from the dead. Now, the mission of Jesus Christ includes the salvation of our souls. But it extends beyond that. It goes further than that. It is also including... It also includes the removal of death and corruption completely. So the plan of salvation will be fully fulfilled on the last day when we stand with one another with incorruptible bodies in incorruptible relationships on an incorruptible earth. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead in an incorruptible body, meaning he is the first one but there will be more. You're going to die one day, and your body's going to be buried in the ground. And when you rise from the dead, if you're in Christ, you will rise with an incorruptible body. And on that day, you will rise in a new heavens and a new earth that will also be incorruptible. Everything we know decays and corrupts right now. But on that day, there will be complete incorruption. And this is what it means that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. It's almost like Christ was the break of dawn. The light is just coming up. And then, as the light travels across the face of the earth, it brings incorruptible life to everything that blossoms and blooms and flourishes and multiplies. And then the, the sun finally rises to high noon, and everything is teeming with life incorruptibly. And this is the final plan. This is where things are headed. Things are headed to complete incorruption. And the purpose of all of this that I have just mentioned, Christ being the head of the church, Christ being the beginning of the church, Christ being the firstborn of the dead, my first three points, moves towards, finds its fulfillment in him being preeminent. Everything he is preeminent in. This means that he has priority of place in all decisions and practices of the church. This means that his word is to be the final authority in our worship, in our discipline, and in our decisions as a church. His word alone. All other words must bow to that. To allow someone else's word to take preeminence over Jesus Christ would be to deny his preeminency, and it would be to deny him the reward of his sufferings. Jesus Christ is head of the church, is beginning of the church, is the firstborn of the dead, has preeminence in the church. He is central to everything that we do. Everything we do must be around Jesus and under Jesus. And he has final say in your life, in my life, in the church. That's what it means that he's preeminent and he has earned it. How he, has he earned it? He's earned it because he's the church's head. He's earned it because he's the beginning of the church. And he's earned it because he is the firstborn from the dead. And that gives him the right to be preeminent in the church, to have sovereignty and authority and rulership over everything that we do, individuals and collectively. Jesus Christ... Head of the church, point one. Jesus Christ, beginning of the church, point two. Jesus Christ, firstborn from the dead, point three. Here's point four. Jesus Christ, the mediator. The mediator. We need a mediator between us and God. 
Why do we need a mediator between us and God? Because we are sinners and God is holy. Somebody must bridge the gap between us and God. Somebody must speak to God on our behalf and somebody must speak to us on God's behalf. That is Jesus Christ, the mediator. He's the mediator. He is the one through whom we have access to God. He is the one through whom we learn about God and he is the one that pleads our case before God. By his blood, he pleads our case. Christ is the mediator according to verse 19 where it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. I need to define what fullness means. What does fullness mean in that text? Well, one Greek scholar indicated that the word fullness denotes completeness. And it was used for a ship and crew. A full ship would be a ship that's functioning properly. It's not lacking any crew. It's not lacking any part. And it could refer either to the totality of the divine powers, attributes, or perhaps better, to the fullness of saving grace and power which belongs to one constituted a Savior. Colossians 2 verse 3 picks up on this concept where it says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2 verse 9 says something similar. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. What this means is that the mediatorial role of Jesus Christ does not belong to any others. Why? Because the fullness of God is in him. It's not 99% God in him. It's not 50% God in him. The fullness of God is in Christ. And so, the mediatorial role of Jesus Christ is not shared with any other. There are some religions or some traditions that might claim there are other mediators or mediatrixes between us and God or us and Christ. There's no way you can argue that from Scripture, especially with this passage. Why? Because the fullness of God dwells in him. There's no other way to God through, except through Jesus Christ. And then it dwells in him. And when we talk about the word dwell, I think we need to make some important points about the way this word is written in, in the Greek. It is, first of all, to live, to dwell, or to settle down. The word indicates permanent abode. The tense of the verb means to take up one's permanent abode to take up permanent residence, okay? So the fullness of God in full does not temporarily reside on Jesus Christ, is what that is saying. The fullness of God in full permanently resides in Jesus Christ. It's not like Christ rose from the dead and he lost some of the fullness of God, or he ascended to heaven and he lost some of the fullness of God. The fullness of God is always in Christ, which means he's the perfect mediator and he's the always mediator. He's always the mediator. He's always the mediator that we need. The fullness of God is in Christ and it dwells in Christ. And here's the thing. If you want access to God, you need one man and that's the man Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other way. The only way to God is by Christ. Why? Because the fullness of God dwells in him permanently. Permanently. So I want the little children to pay attention. Listen, little children. Listen up. If you're, you're coloring right now, I know, and I'm so thankful for how well behaved you are. You're doing a wonderful job. But listen up, little children. I want you to listen to me because I have something I want to share with you. You need to come to God through Jesus. You must. It's not enough that your parents are Christians. It's not enough that they take you to church. It's not enough that you sing and pray in your homes. You must, listen children, you must come to God through Jesus. And so I'm pleading with you little ones. It's a wonderful opportunity and blessing for me to preach to you today. And I'm pleading with you. While I have your attention and you've been so good, I want you to come to God through Jesus. Because that's the only way you're going to get to God. You're not going to get to Him through your parents. You're not going to get to Him through coming to church. You must come through Jesus. 
So thank you for listening, little children. Have you come to Jesus? If not, now you must. You must. Anyone else in this building? Anyone else that can hear me? If you don't know Christ and you haven't come to God by Christ, you must. There's no other way. You can't get to him anywhere. You can't get to him by your good works. You can't get to him through some other saint. You can only come through Jesus. And so I'm offering to you today Jesus Christ, the mediator. The mediator. So I've made four points about Jesus Christ, four truths about Jesus Christ. Number one, he's the head of the church. Number two, he is the beginning. Number three, he is the firstborn. Number four, he is the mediator. Here's the fifth point. I promised you five. Fifth point. Here it is. You ready? You ready? I don't think you are. I think you want me to wait a little while. Okay. He is the reconciler. The reconciler. The reconciler. Verse 20 says, Through him... To reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the blessing of the fullness of God dwelling in Christ. Is that he reconciles all things to himself. Now, when we talk about all things, we're not talking about universalism. He's not saying, from a, as we balance scripture against scripture, he's not saying that all people will be saved. That's not what he's saying. I will define what all things means in a moment. But before I define what all things means in a moment, I must define what reconcile means. And reconcile means this. It means the exchange of hostility for friendship. It implies a restitution to a state from which one has fallen. The meaning is to effect a thorough change back. That's what one scholar indicated. I think that's a good definition, okay? To change from hostility to friendship. So imagine someone's in an army, and there's a commanding officer, and one of his soldiers commits treason. And so if the soldier commits treason, the commanding officer now has the authority to hang the soldier. But instead of hanging the soldier, he pardons him and doesn't hang him. But he doesn't just not hang him, he makes the soldier his best friend. That's reconciliation. We who are once hostile to God and God who is once hostile towards us have become friends. Not just pardoned, but we have friendship with God. This is the wonderful offer of the gospel. Do you have friendship with God? You can find friendship with God through Jesus Christ no matter how bad a sinner you are. No matter how dark and dirty your deeds are. Come to God through Jesus, the great reconciler. And notice what it says. He reconciles all things to himself. Again, this does not mean universalism. What this means is he brings peace to all that is subjected under his feet. Everything. Okay? Everything that falls under the feet of Jesus, under his supremacy and under his rulership and under his law is now reconciled together. Is now reconciled together. Okay? Through Christ and his cross, the universe is brought back or restored to its proper relationship to God. This is what William Hendrickson noted. Through Christ and his cross, the universe is brought back or restored to its proper relationship to God. Meaning that the world was at peace after creation. At corruption, the world was not at peace. It was at war. But through Christ, peace is now achieved. So you want to know how to find peace? You submit to God, and then you find peace with everything else that is in submission to God. When people step out of submission to God, peace falls apart. We are purchased by the blood of Jesus, and by that blood we find grace to submit Sins are pardoned, we're made friends of God, and we find grace to submit. And when God gives us that grace, he brings about peace. And peace, of course, peace, of course, is defined as 
to make peace. The part describes the means of the reconciliation. Okay, so what happens is, is you put peace in place and the tempers quell. The hostility quells. So, here's how it looks. People find peace with God, and those who find peace with God find peace with each other. Because the body of Christ understands that the movement of sanctification is a movement of reconciliation. And this occurs by the blood of his cross. Now, to say that we can find peace with creation and with each other through other psychologies or other methods is to deny the centrality of, cross, of the cross. Okay? True peace is only found in the cross. And so this closes with this statement, making peace by the blood of his cross. And this means that the bloody sacrifice of Jesus Christ turned away God's anger towards us, brought us into friendship with God, and is such brings us into friendship with one another. God is the great forgiver of sins. He makes friends of sinners, becomes friends with sinners, and makes sinners friends with one another. The Christian life is one moving towards reconciliation with one another, not avoiding it. Because we know what reconciliation is and we live as reconciled creatures to God. So I'll say this. Divisions in society, racial or otherwise, can only be reconciled truly by the blood of the cross. Amen. And this is what happened at Calvary. Because in the New Testament, what did you have? You had Gentiles and Jews coming together in the same church. And they hated each other. Massive racial tensions. But by the blood of the cross, they came together and there was peace under Christ. Doesn't mean it was easy. That's why a few of the New Testament letters had to be written to help them reconcile to each other. But true reconciliation, the one thing, one of the things we have to offer this world is true reconciliation amongst groups that are hostile to one another is the cross of Christ. Because on that cross, all our sins are done away with. Our sins towards God and our sins towards one another. He forgives them and pardons them. This means that churches learn to live at peace when they learn to live reconciled to one another because of what Christ has accomplished. And one of the things that I advise people when I do marriage counseling, you want to be reconciled in your marriage? This is what you need, the blood of the cross. You must see each other as Christ sees you. What is that? Pardoned sinners who have made, been made friends of God and who can be friends with each other. That's not easy. It takes work. It takes patience. It takes being slow to speak and, and quick to listen and slow to become angry. But it happens over time. Understanding our own place before the cross leads to reconciliation with God and the reconciliation of all things, which is going to happen at the end of the world. What's going to happen? We're going to be living in incorruptible bodies, in incorruptible relationships with one another, on an incorruptible earth. Why? Because Christ is not just preeminent over creation. He is preeminent over the new creation. He's head of the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn. He is the mediator. And he is the reconciler, preeminent over the new creation, his own church purchased by his own blood.